Yeah, Professor Nick, can you hear us? I can speak now. Yes, we are able to hear you. Yeah. Uh, but can you can he hear us? No, I think he's not able to hear us. But we are able to hear him. Um. What's the problem? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Vinay, are you there? We are able to hear you. Hello. 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 Yeah. 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 Mission check. You need access now. Yeah, he's. Uh, I can. I can see his screen. Yeah. yeah. We are able to see your screen. Yeah. We are able to see your screen. Okay. So maybe you can talk. So, so are we already? Maybe you can talk. Yeah. You ready to start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can uh, talk. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can talk. Not... I think. Okay. Uh, okay. Can we start um, uh, five minutes Sheila later, sir? From the South Pacific, for uh, it's just after that. midnight here, so it's um, quite a big time difference, I guess, to the rest of the world. My name is Nick Roscrooch, and I'm a professor in ethnobotany uh, here in a place called Palmerston, North New Zealand. But I'm also the chairman of um, a indigenous horticultural collective called Tauri Whenua. You'll see on the slides the information for this group, and we'll make this PowerPoint available after the lecture as well. I shall just... Uh, just as by way of a bit of background on myself, I've been um, a long time uh, in the horticultural industry, but by training, I'm what's called an ethnopedologist. I did my PhD some time ago in traditional soil science, so ethnopedology and um, ethnobotany. Currently, I look after the horticulture program here at the university, but I've also spent some time in the US on a Fulbright program. I chair this collective, and I spend a lot of time with our Pacific Regional Development Programs training farmers um, on much of the uh, South Pacific. A lot of that around climate change and um, the adaption, adapting of crops. I belong to the New Zealand's Environmental Protection Authority, and I'm also a member of the Royal Society here. Um, the most recent bit of work there was our taxonomy review for the country. But we're going to have a talk about Māori, um, traditional horticulture from Māori, and in a moment I'll just sort of back back to Māori, yeah, but Māori are traditional horticulturists with an enduring relationship to our natural world. And in traditional times, that's what they relied on for sustenance sustenance, sorry, but more recently for an economic opportunity. So we're going to have a look at what that economic opportunity looks like. Māori horticultural systems are, have a unique values base, which informs the production and the sustainability principles they apply, and from which the economic opportunity can be gained. So this value system is, offers significant worth to Māori in the first instance, and it also connects quite strongly to the organic sector. So we'll look at four things. One is where we are here, or where I am here in New Zealand. The other local name for New Zealand is Aotearoa. Some, just some facts on what that is. Who and what defines us as Māori? What is Māori horticulture? And where is that trending? What does the future look like? So here we are. This is um, a map of Aotearoa New Zealand. We are at the, um, the very south, southern end of the South Pacific, population of uh, trending towards 5 million people. So it's quite a small population. And a third of that population live in the very north of the country around Auckland. Māori account for around about 14% of the population. Our country, uh, 268 square kilometers. In a very maritime climate. So the climate is defined by the oceans because we are really a set of islands. Never. As Māori, Māori are the indigenous people of New Zealand. So um, 
we were here prior to the uh, colonial period. Key mi migration period for Māori uh, stems across the Pacific Ocean around about 900 years ago from other islands also in the South Pacific. We have very strong relationships across the Pacific, very um, common factors, uh, both language, um, history, proper, proper, which is genealogy, all of that is very common across the Pacific. Traditionally, we were what's called subsistence horticulturists, so we grew enough food to survive, and what extra was grown was traded for other foods. But Māori uh, survive on a very vibrant oral history and traditions. The picture you'll see on that slide, an example of a traditional house, which we call a marae, and in this case, a community house, not a um, single family, but we these are our meeting places. So here you are, here's um, how we see the world. The, for us, if you look at this map, it appears upside down from the, what other people sort of see the world, uh, the map of the world. But this is our interpretation of, of our place in the world and that we are at the top of the map rather than at the bottom. You'll see straight under the, the label um, New Zealand. Aotearoa and um, for us the southern island is the canoe and, and the northern island is the fish that was fished up so it fits with our oral history. So colonisation here is reasonably recent around about um, or not around that in 1769 Captain Cook made the first contact. He found New Zealand to be a very tribal society, geographically very diverse but following him, there was very much a, an early influx of whalers and sealers and people introducing new crops, new tools, new economics, new clothing. The missionaries followed and they had a huge influence on setting up the governance of this country. And then came the immigrants. It, it's quite a complex history, but in 1840, there was a treaty signed between Māori and the Crown. And, and through that treaty, Māori ceded to the British Crown uh, for them to establish a government. Effectively, we became part of the British Empire. That treaty has had a sort of a up and down relationship with our government, but at the current time, the principles of the treaty are what is now followed in law. Those principles are believed to be around partnership between Māori and the Crown, protection, uh, that the Crown would protect Māori interests. The essential bargain is that that was so that um, they could govern the country and Rangatiratanga, which we'll just have a look at. Rangatiratanga is the term used in Māori literally for chieftainship, but it confers the right for Māori to be making the decision about their own future. And as I say, it's conferred um, as a principle of the treaty way back in 1840. But what it really means for Māori is that it promotes economic self-determination for Māori as an, as an independent um, economic driver um, for indigenous um, activity. So it's captured in this term rangatiratanga and it's applied as a cultural value, if you like, on all things Māori, so all our activities. Economic self-determination recognises the Māori desire to be determining their own destiny especially when it's um, related to economic well-being, to have the material wealth and income that meets their own needs and to be able to contribute to the wider economic growth of our country. In Māori terms, our cultural uh, view of the world, we call te ao Māori, the Māori world. And that view is based on an Indigenous value set. And for us, the simplest way to... Um, to be able to define that uh, for other people to, to try and understand is that that value set has four realms, four layers. The first is cultural, the second is the physical, the social realm, and then the intellectual realm. All these realms are pertinent to our sustainability, both as people and for our resources. None of them have any priority over the other, but ultimately the respect for our natural resources is that we treat them as part of our own family. So, cultural sustainability. 
we have a term called whakapapa, which effectively in English is very similar to uh, our descent, our genealogical descent. The whakapapa identifies who we are and identifies our relationship to other people, to the land, to the place, and to our history. So it's, it's the key cultural identifier for things Māori. It is the backbone of the culture and it contains our worldview. Also alongside Whakapapa is the intergenerational respect and responsibility in that we, by generations, we train or we teach the next generation their role in society, but also their role in ensuring that our natural resources are maintained for the future. And part of that is the um, expectation that our people, our young ones will come through and become the guardians for that natural resource. In cultural senses, we have a very spatial acknowledgement. We understand our relationship across um, areas. So it's not just where we sit, but it's we have an influence. Uh, for example, the river flows from the mountains to the sea. Then we have that responsibility across the whole length of the river. Um, so, but we need to apply this in a contemporary world. Resource sustainability um, is the physical element. So we have um, this role as guardian, as kaitiaki, to, to ensure that we look after our resources. We have to find an, a balance somehow between exploitation and depletion of those resources. It's, we are, culturally, we understand that we need to access the resources to be able to grow our food, to be able to trade products, but we need to do that in a balance that allows us to continue accessing those resources over time. We need to deal with modern issues, um, biosecurity problems, water use, um, climate change, all of those things, food security, food sovereignty, all of those things which are current issues which didn't exist uh, 100, 200 years ago for our people. There's always a role for the experts. We tend to expect our people now to be trained in a modern system for their expertise, but in the old days, they were trained by the older generations. But more than anything, the responsibility for our physical resources belongs to everyone. So we all have to take um, some role in their management, how we look after it. This is social sustainability. Again, to identify how we operate socially is based on whakapapa, as I've just mentioned. And whakapapa, in this case, is about upholding status, ensuring that we retain that status in the eyes of the people around us. It recognises the response or the relationship, sorry, between us as a people in the spiritual world, in the physical world, it recognises those relationships between families, between the groupings of families, sub-tribes, and between the tribes, the bigger groupings. And it has very much a recognition of the temporal factor. So we don't diminish relationships over time. They will, even though your, for example, your great-grandparents or your great-great-grandparents, uh, they have the same relationship as the present-day people. So we don't... Um, Nothing is devalued by time. And lastly, there's what we would call intellectual sustainability. The term Mātauranga Māori is a reference to traditional knowledge, and traditional knowledge is built over generations of um, experience and learning. It contains the unique cultural values uh, that have been also evolved or developed over that time. There is, of course, contemporary knowledge. So we, we now have to look at how traditional knowledge is applied in modern times. We have to deal with things like intellectual property. There's, uh, just as an example for traditional medicines, so there's a lot of people interested in trying to commercialise traditional medicines. So how do we deal with that intellectual property element? There's a lot of political and economic interests that are outside of our cultural space. The government want to ensure that Māori land is accessed to um, contribute to our GDP, our gross domestic product. The intellectual sustainability also draws from 
the education um, sector, and more than anything from a cultural perspective, it draws from experience. So I've mentioned this term a couple of times, the kaitiaki. Um, kaitiaki is a term in very simple language means the guardian. So it's an inherited role. It comes through your, as an inheritance through being Māori. The word is broken down. You'll see on that slide, kai in this case, meaning the person, and tiaki is the verb to protect something. Uh, sometimes we say kai tiaki tanga, which means we put it into action. Literally translated as guardianship, and our government have included it in some of our statutes or laws, so it's recognised in law. We use the traditional tools of society, of Māori society, to try and re achieve resource management. Those traditional tools are based on uh, matters such as tapu, which is things that are treated as sacred. The opposite to that is nor, or where things have been cleansed of their sacred elements so that they can be used. And again, whakapapa and, and other tools. Amongst all of this, we constantly make application of what we call karakia, which are the prayers that are used to bring the physical world, the one that we live in, and the spiritual world, the one that we draw from, to bring them together to ensure that everything works. Lastly, we have a, a cultural expression called Modi, which is our reference to what could be called cultural quality. And Modi recognizes that everything has an inherent um, factor, and that factor, if it is um, in good condition, um, is expressed as having good Modi. So just as an example, the quality of water in the river is based on the, um, the expression of Modi. So if it has been degraded in any way, that Modi has been degraded. We do follow a set of rules for kaitiakitanga. They're not, it's, um, it has been put into to words, if you like, so that our young people can start to, to um, learn from it. These rules are as expressed by our late Māori Queen, she died a couple of years back, but this is what she told us, how she led us. Firstly, take only what you need from the resources, share the rest. Respect the limits of those resources, protect the basis of the wealth, but most importantly, to pass on to future generations at least as good as we received. Those are the tenets, those are the rules that we apply for um, our kaitakitanga, our resource management. The, um, just for your interest, the Māori Queen comes from our, our Māori monarchy, the Kingitanga, which was um, where all the tribes came together maybe about 160 years ago now in a response to the colonial uh, system to ensure that Māori were represented um, appropriately across all of our tribes. Economic sustainability for us, and this is the second half of of our talk is we're looking at what we, where we're going for the future in the sense of being able to hold on to our culture as Māori, but contribute to the economic opportunity. Economic sustainability is based on a number of factors. Firstly, that it impacts across all areas of resource utility. It requires a balance across those four realms we've just talked about, the cultural, the social, the intellectual and the physical. It requires respect for the resource and understanding of what the limitations are on those resources. So we need to know just what it is we can draw and where we need to um, preserve. There are differences between the true value of some of our natural products and the actual economic, the dollar value of those products. So similarly, the true cost to the resource is against the dollar cost. And of course, we're looking at what diversification means and how that stands for risk. Traditional horticulture for Māori um, in the old days was defined as agriculture, but it's really based on subsistence farming. And subsistence farming 
for Māori was primarily on natural harvests. Most of the foods were not um, produced in the managed systems. They were harvested from the, the bush and from the forest. Prior to Europeans arriving in this country, there were no grazing animals. And it was very much a holistic system. Everything was landscape focused rather than uh, unique activities. Our key foods, some of these you'll be familiar with, the kumara or the sweet potato, the hue or the gourd, you'll see a picture down at the bottom, the ufi, yams, aruhe, which is the fern root, the root of um, some of the ferns that are grown here, and um, taro, ondalo. They are common across the Pacific. So I think I mentioned earlier that we have a very close relationship across the Pacific and our foods is one of those relationships. A very wide range of harvested foods from the wild and that includes birds and, and what have you from the bush. And in the old days, traditional systems were based on transient occupation. So people moved according to the food opportunity. So in the summer, or in the spring, for example, they would be closer to the sea so that they could harvest fish for drying. And then in the summer, they would work their crops, harvest their crops in the spring and move back into the um, palisaded settlements in the winter. The future opportunities for Māori are really about how we can add value to the products, uh, to the product that we, we grow. So if we, apply our sustainable practices as kaitaki, then we believe that we can add value to the market and not just here in New Zealand, but around the world. So the opportunity exists to learn from our practices as producers of products and as an indigenous opportunity. And it's being able to ensure that those practices can be applied and that they are doing what they need to do. So if we have to deal with pests and disease in the crops that our practices can do that. According to our New Zealand government, our economy depends on primary sector production. Over 80% of our export income comes from primary sector. 14% of our businesses, of all our businesses are in agricultural horticulture and about 26% of all Māori businesses are in the same sector. Less focused on horticulture, much of it is based on large-scale farming, so sheep and beef farming, um, dairy production, but increasingly more of it on crops like kiwi fruit and um, apples, the pip fruit. But our primary industries also include energy, which is the wind farms and the um, electricity generation, fisheries, mining, um, and a whole lot of other primary sector. Our horticulture sector is export and reliant. I think our population of four and a half to five million is not enough to really purchase all of what we can grow. So we rely on external income. So that comes from export. We have a very diverse landscape. So you can grow from the north of New Zealand subtropical crops right down to the southern end of New Zealand where you're getting into almost sub-Antarctic crops. So a very diverse landscape and we can grow a very diverse range of crops. The, um, those crops that get exported include fruit, vegetables, cut flowers, foliage, seed, a lot of seed crops, a lot of processed crops, so frozen and dried. And then of course we're looking at using organics, indigenous and, and other added value components for our export products. Our highest value sectors are in kiwi fruit, apples and onions. But with our processed sectors, the highest values are in wine, potatoes and peas. So quite a diverse range of crops just in that. The largest market for us is um, Southeast Asia and it's followed by Australia, um, the Americas and Europe. The trends for us to add value to our crops, you'll see this picture here with some of the, the fern, the pickle pickle that we um, grow and put onto the market. The trends for us in understanding our landscape, what it is that gives us the unique market, the cultural renaissance, so rebuilding that cultural opportunity, looking at how we participate 
with the bigger industry at large, so the non-Māori sector, accessing innovation and embracing diversity. Our landscape, oops, is really based on a whole lot of um, quite unique factors. One is that Māori have become quite an urban culture. We have shifted to the cities. Very strong political influence of the country on what we do, but we've lost our, our traditional knowledge. We've lost a fair uh, percentage of what was known prior to colonization. Most of it because it was unrecorded, it was just held by the old people. And now we have a, a situation where the technology is starting to drive as against the mataranga or the traditional knowledge. And the land that is retained by Māori is often isolated, discontinuous, and um, hard to access. So the Renaissance is interesting. We are looking at rebuilding or recapturing traditional knowledge around soils, plants, and horticulture, restoring the relationship of people to the land, reintroducing some of those traditional tools, things like the guardianship, the maramataka, which is our lunar calendar, soil management, looking at how we connect those to contemporary tools, the restoration of that knowledge to the new generation, and trying to ensure that we are participants in the national economy. For us, the future is based on these four things, leadership, succession, education, and cultural integrity. To access innovation, we expect that as Māori innovation will help us lead change, will help us own ideas and the concepts, introduce new business models, introduce new and emerging technology, investment in R&D, but most of all contribute to the sustainability of our resources. Embracing diversity means that we want to ensure that Māori inputs are recognised in a mixed system, so producing our crops using traditional knowledge, that we are providing leadership within the Pacific, so it's not just a New Zealand thing, it's a Pacific, South Pacific thing. There is a role for Indigenous inputs in a global market. People will pay for the Indigenous contribution. But we have to ensure our new generations coming through understand what that means and understand how they can take their culture forward. And we also understand that the 21st century changes so fast, the new language, the new technology and all of that. How do we keep up with that as an old culture? The issues are quite clear. What is the trade-off for us as growers, for example, against the organic systems? The global world that we now belong to has brought a whole lot of different issues for us as Indigenous, especially around intellectual property, but also around things like climate change, the food sovereignty with our plants, that technical revolution, biological impacts on our systems. There's a, a lot of biological issues across the border and that social responsibility that exists. So the, one of the questions is, should we be indigenous or organic? You'll all understand that organic is a response to the chemical revolution. It's, it creates an alternative or it offers an alternative production system and very much philosophically based. Indigenous systems, on the other hand, are culturally based, the systems approached, and they are both dynamic and responsive. But more than anything, they can be aligned to a strong marketing opportunity as our organics. As Māori, we believe that we can be competitive in an organic system. We have underutilised land, we have a philosophical base that contribute out to that. Both systems, Māori and organics, um, are marketable. For us, within New Zealand, the issue is that we have a very limited local market, that everything has to be targeted at the export opportunity. And we have to ensure that cultural integrity gets taken off or gets um, carried through into that uh, export opportunity. The technical revolution is an interesting one. It means that our traditional knowledge uh, is moving from an oral culture to one that's very highly technically um, 
managed and constantly changing. So who owns our knowledge now that it's all um, available on the internet? Not all of it, but a fair bit of it has been made accessible and available. And how do we ensure the quality of that knowledge that people have access to and that um, we can keep up with it? How do we put that into our new business models? The landscape of New Zealand is subject to some key issues these days, some of them like biological threats. We have a, the biosecurity of our border with new pests, and you'll see the one on the top of the screen, the psyllid, which came in from Hawaii some years ago, affected our crops by up to 90% losses. Um, so how do we deal with that? And how does traditional knowledge contribute to the um, management when you have these new pressure on what we do? We're looking to optimize our land opportunity. We're looking to minimize what that means on our land. We don't want to be uh, affecting our land in a negative way. Education is seen as the imperative for everyone to be fully involved. Education is the tool, knowledge is the, is the strength going forward in the future and succession, ensuring that we train the next generation and the next generation in how to be good land managers and how to take Māori forward. But all of that requires investment. And it's not just money, but it's investment of time, it's investment of expertise and of support and the social strengths. So all of that requires some control. This slide just looks at what some of the challenges are for Māori land. You know, we have, some of our blocks have huge numbers of owners because the system has a succession program where all of your children become owners. But a lot of the people now, what we call absentee owners, they don't live on the land. They live elsewhere in the cities or maybe in Australia. Much of Māori land is not arable land. It's in the hills. It's in the back blocks of forests and what have you. So it's not used uh, for any economic gain. And as Māori, we can't gain access to capital from the banks because our land is non it's protected by law, so it can't be sold and it can't be used as some um, collateral. So those are some of the issues that exist for us with Māori land. So here we are, we're just about at the end of, the, of this conversation. What does the future look like for us as Māori? Diversification, the economic and the commercial activities for Māori will be built on, on some new opportunities, especially around food and beverages, processing, tourism. Education is an imperative, that integration of traditional knowledge, of contemporary knowledge and technology has to, has to happen. And there needs to be an acknowledgement of what Māori inputs provide to systems and how they add value. Tourism, although COVID has affected this in the last 12 months, it really provides a considerable opportunity for us, which is quite a passive opportunity. Māori tourism, it's often about giving people access to the natural world, that experience of the natural world. We call it rural tourism, but also some of our traditional foods. Here you'll see a slide that indicates some of those foods, the mutton bird, which is uh, harvested from the Southern Islands. Taiwa are the um, traditional potatoes, the dairy products and all of that. So all of those things are opportunities we can share and make money from. So it's been a, a fast talk, but um, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen. I'll finish with a, an old whakatauki or an old proverb from our people. This is hiata mel nui o te ao. What is the greatest thing in this world? He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is people, it is people, it is people. We recognize that without the people component to how we contribute to our world, we don't go anywhere. So ko haere hokamua, ko haere hokamuri. We look to the past to gain that insight which will take us into the future. Uh, so thank you, kia ora maira. Uh, atu anō to you all. Again, there's some pictures there that show some of our foods and some of our activity. But um, that's me for the moment. So if you have any questions, feel free to come forward. Kapai, mi atu anō 
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nick, for that wonderful presentation and uh, taking us, uh, uh, giving us a really detailed idea about uh, the Maori community. I now uh, request uh, the participants to uh, type out their questions if they have. And Karim sir, uh, uh, since uh, uh, Professor Nick cannot hear us, can you just uh, message him to uh, read the questions in the chat box? We will ask him. Professor Nick, are you able to hear? Can you hear no, us, I sir? Think. No, yeah. I can't hear him. Okay. Huh? Can you message him, sir, personally? Yeah, yeah. No, I think in the chat he can see. Yeah, so can you tell him to read out the questions from there? Yeah, yeah. No, there's no questions, I think. It's only uh, appreciation is there. The one question is there, sir. Yeah. Yeah, so there are a few questions. Can you ask him to take questions? Can you ask him? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, could you, could you, could you, could you uh, see the message? Uh, da, 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 da. Which one? How can we join the private communities? Uh, yes, yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, if you look, I'm going to share this uh, PowerPoint with the university, but if you look, there'll be some links that you can have a look online to be familiar with the communities and uh, you're welcome to make contact and join from there. We very much Pacific sort of centric and that all the people around the Pacific are a part of our activity in our communities here. Okay. But, uh, so Tahuri Whenua is the name, if I go back to the uh, Beginning of the slide from beginning. Ooh, we must be. You'll see on here it talks about Tahuri Fenua. It's got my email, but it also you can have a look up Tahuri Fenua online and also on Facebook as a group. So uh, that's the best way to have a to follow how some of that happens. Uh, so I think the there's another please. question just come through about can Māori practice be replicated anywhere yeah. in the world, and I'm sure it can. It's all it's all based on the philosophy of what makes good resource management. So our philosophy is is based on cultural experience, and that really is is quite particular to this part of the world but it can be translated into other parts of the world oh ethnomedicine the we call it rongoa r-o-n-g-o-a which is our traditional medicines the fate we very much practiced here in new zealand the fate is that a lot of the commercial companies are trying to access traditional uh, knowledge on the plants and on some of those medicines. So we have, I think I talked about intellectual property. We have a real issue with people trying to take advantage of our intellectual knowledge, uh, especially around medicines. The New Zealand the agricultural sector is starting to take notice of, of Māori inputs. I think part of that is that our government, with their funding for agricultural research, requires those researchers to be cognizant of, of Māori interests. So they are starting to um, take notice of it. But really the big machine, the agriculture machine around dairy production, around kiwi fruit and apples is way advanced of the indigenous activity. So it's quite a bit of a catch up um, happening there. Ooh, the Sunday. word Māori, the etymology of the word. Māori is, we have another word for non-Māori that's Pākehā. So Māori is 
the term that identifies uh, the, it's used across the Pacific for different um, cultures. So if you go to Rarotonga, they're also called Māori, Tahiti, also called Māori. So it's a common term that refers to the indigenous people of those islands. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Nick. <laughs> Myself is uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan. I'm also an ethnobotanist. He cannot yeah. hear us. Okay. <laughs> Somebody's so, asking uh, about. Okay. Uh, no, I'm working on your same Maori systems. And I think one of the, the points about the organic was trying to, to make was that a lot of our indigenous people look to organics as a production system that they can be comfortable with, where we agree with that, but we also think that we should be comfortable promoting our indigenous system as a marketing value, if you like. So the foods that we produce to our own um, inputs have value on the markets by those indigenous inputs. Uh, if you're asking any other example for Māori systems around the world, again, um, if you go to South America to some of the indigenous cultures around the southern end of Chile, uh, or some of the communities in um, Peru and what have you. They have very similar systems in the crops they grow and, and how they take those crops to market. So I think that's a representation of the common uh, relationship between our spiritual and physical worlds in that we apply a very much a spiritual layer to everything we do. Uh, Folk taxonomy in the Māori community, the, this last question. Taxonomy as in the naming for plants and animals and insects. And yes, there is. That belongs to the whakapapa that we talked about and that everything is named and there's an order how they all fit together as almost like a genealogy between people and plants and places. And it's quite... The structure is very similar to the botanical classification, but it's quite unique in its own way. As an example, one of the trees that we use as a food source is called a cabbage tree, a tikoka, and the taxonomy around that tree is based on all of the insects and all of the uh, pests and what have you that live on that tree are all connected through that taxonomy. So it's based on the, the species rather than based on, on the botanical classification, which is the families. That might be the last question. Dr. Nick, Professor Nick, thank you. <laughs> sir, he can't hear, sir. No, he can't hear. You have to put the uh, uh, thing in the... Uh, um, message. Oh, okay, okay, okay. He will okay. respond to you from the message. That's okay, the issue. No problem. No problem. Thank you. you can put in the message. He'll respond to you immediately. No, 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 no. Okay, please carry on. Any other question from others? Mm. Ah, yeah. One question has come. Yeah, I think it's looking. <laughs> the pests and diseases. Yes. Hey, um, we have some very traditional ways of dealing with some of the pest issues in our crops, usually around fumigation, using certain plants as fumigant plants um, in the crops. But one of the issues really is that most of our pest and disease problems are introduced problems. They didn't exist in traditional times. So we've had to look at what we've used in traditional problems and try and transfer them to, to some of the modern issues that are coming through but definitely they align very well to the low input processes of how we grow crops um, and very much so to the organic sector as well. That might be us.
Any other questions? Nishant, you're getting any questions? <laughs> the status of youngsters learning this from their elders. The um, and I'll just close with this because uh, I think, but our one of our probably one of our current issues is how do we get our young people to to stay engaged and to be in, involved in the future management of our resources. They're all uh, all tempted by new technology. The phones are taking over their you know, their space, they're starting to look online for all of their learning and what have you. So we have to ensure that their experience from a cultural perspective encourages them to be there. They want to be involved, they want to be learning. And the old people always looked to the young ones to try and see what their strengths were. And you would identify those young kids and, and nurture them through. So we still do that. We still look to, to try and nurture certain young ones through. And um, it's going to be an interesting time going through the next few years, especially with our technology. Okay, folks, me how to ano. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you so much, Professor Nick. Uh, as uh, we all know, uh, we want to take a group picture with you. So I just request everyone to switch on their videos so that we can take a picture quickly. We finished for the day now. I will be waiting for another five seconds for everybody to just switch on their videos. I will send the, uh, the PowerPoint through as soon as this session finishes and you can share it. Thank you so oh, much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I will take the picture at the count of three. So as usual, keep your smiles ready. So one, two, and three. I'll take a few more. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on this uh, webinar. And uh, there's a really interesting proverb uh, from the Maori community, which says that while food provides the blood in our veins, our health is drawn from the land. This is a very important proverb in today's circumstances where concepts like One Health are becoming more and more important and it should inspire us to not just have a healthy body but also a healthy planet. I again hope that all of you are safe and in Maori words, I want to say kia kaha, which translates to stay strong during these tough times. It's a pandemic going on. And I wish you all good health and take care of yourselves. Thank you so much for joining. I will be, uh, we will be uploading this on our YouTube channel so that you can go and uh, check uh, Professor Nick's talk again, if you would wish to uh, see it again. And also if there are any questions left, you can mail it to us. We'll definitely get in touch with Professor Nick and get them answered. And as Professor Nick said, we'll be sending the presentation. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And I wish.